Lord, for everything. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. And so here we are. First of all, before I get started, let me say to everybody, um, I thank God for you. Amen. Uh, here we are, you know, Thanksgiving weekend, and um, it's been, you know, kind of a up and down year, right? <laughs> this has been kind of, kind of, kind of all kinds of things going on this year, but, you know, we still can take the time to give God thanks. And so I just want to say personally to everyone, you know, starting with Pastor Hackett, you know, the, the shepherd of our house, uh, amen, uh, of our church house, amen, the, the ministry that God has given us through Greater Light. Pastor, thank you so much for being such a wonderful and uh, God-fearing and God-following leader. We thank God for you, amen. I want to say thank you to all the elders and the deacons, amen, and the brothers and sisters in the Lord, hallelujah, the family here, uh, the mothers, even the young people. I just want to say thank you to all of you um, because I know that your concern is definitely there uh, for my family and my wife. So thank you very much for that. And I just wanted to just take a moment to say that to all of you today. <clears throat> it gives me great honor to be here to share with you once again, as we break the bread. Um, my book that I was given is uh, First and Second Corinthians. And so um, I'm gonna, gonna deliver this as God gave it to me. And I, I, it's just an amazing thing and I want to say this is going to be a little bit different this morning because um, what I'm going to do um, by the leading of the Holy Ghost is I'm going to share one verse out of each chapter of 2 Corinthians. And it's going, it's going to flow like one conversation. It's, it's amazing how God put that together as I was studying. And um, I'm just going to share with you as we get into this word, as I summarize the teachings this year from the book of first and second Corinthians. And I just want to say this, in the first letter to the Corinthians, Paul was in his third year of ministry. He was in Ephesus. Now this was around 56 AD. That was like 56 years after the Lord had gotten, you know, um, put up on the cross. And then the three days he rose. And then after that, you know, the day of Pentecost, and then he went on to be with, with God in heaven. So this was 56 years after that. And what happened was, you know, everybody still had Jesus on their mind, right? I mean, it was, it, Jesus came and just turned everything, you know, around, everything for everybody. And so here we are, Paul, and you guys know the story of Paul. And Paul was Saul before he got anointed um, to be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was a persecutor of the Christians. And so quite naturally, you know, when he came into being a minister, an apostle representing the Lord, there was a little bit of skepticism around his ministry. And so what happened was when he began to get on the scene, the church of Corinth actually had put a report out asking all these questions around Christianity and how to live. And so that's where we get the book of 1 Corinthians from, because that was a response that Paul wrote based on the questions that came to him. Now, what was crazy about that was that those questions were all over the board. And as you see, and you guys have read 1 Corinthians, you see that there were things around leadership. There were things that Paul addressed around sexual immorality lawsuits among believers, marriage, spiritual gifts, love, you know, the love chapter that we read every Sunday in uh, 1 Corinthians 13. And then of course, the collection of money to support the church. That is what made up 1 Corinthians. But here's what happened. After that letter was received by the church, of course, there were some naysayers. <laughs> there are obviously those that didn't like what he wrote. As you guys know, there was some pretty, pretty stern things in there. God made some very, very um, blatant guidelines that we should follow as we are actually living this Christian life. And so quite naturally, there were people that were like, well, what does Paul know? You know, he was a sinner. He was a killer of the Christians. You know, they were really just kind of trying to discredit his ministry. And so these same people begin to um, put out their own version of their interpretation 
of what happened around Jesus and um, their own interpretation of what was given from some of the scriptures that were read out in the temple. And so here's what happened. Paul got wind of this situation and thus we have another letter. Now, just so that you know, based on historical research, um, actually Paul wrote four letters, okay, four letters. We only got two of them in the Bible. One of them were lost um, that they never recovered. And another one, I don't know what happened to the third one. But the point is, is that we got a record of the first two. No, I, or I'm sorry, we got a record of two. I don't know the exact sequence if, if whether the second Corinthians came after one of the other letters that we don't see, um, that's not clear. But the point is, is that Paul was really in this communicative mode with them because they were going back and forth because they wanted to get the truth. He wanted them to understand the truth. So here it is in this second letter, second Corinthians, Paul felt that he needed to come back and to help the believers that were committed to the truth of God, even if they were in the midst of those who were spreading the false doctrines, he wanted to open his heart and he wanted to share you know, his, his, his perspective on what God had showed him. So through 2 Corinthians, we learned that our ministry, right, sometimes has to be guarded from attack, just like in our personal lives. And also that we can be confident that we are commissioned by Christ and empowered by the Holy Ghost. How many of you believe that today? that we can be confident that we are commissioned by Christ and empowered by the Holy Ghost. As I go through this, again, I'm gonna pull out scriptures from each chapter and you're gonna see the message that God gave to the church in response to all of this. And you'll see how that is very applicable to today. Now, there are four major themes that come from 2 Corinthians. And as I summarize, you know, this book for the whole year, these four things cover it all. Okay, these four things that we get here out of 2 Corinthians cover pretty much the ministry that was given to this particular church. The first theme is spiritual authority. I want you to think about that, your spiritual authority. The second spiritual giving, okay? Third, spiritual warfare. And fourth, spiritual confidence. These are the four themes that we find in the book of Corinthians. And I'm going to launch a poll. This is gonna be a little interactive this morning. I want you to take a look at your screen right now whether you're on a mobile phone, tablet, or computer, you should be able to see this. Now, I want you to take a look at this question and I want you to vote. Which of these do you believe is most important for the church today? Standing in spiritual authority or giving support, giving to support the work of the ministry or understanding spiritual warfare or being spiritually confident. Those are the four themes that we have here in the book of Corinthians. And I want you to vote, take your time right now and make a decision. Which of these do you believe is most important for the church today? Standing in spiritual authority, giving to support the work of ministry, understanding spiritual warfare, or being spiritually confident. I'm gonna ask if everyone could participate, those that could see the poll on their screen, go ahead and just select one. If you're on a phone, you might have to swipe to the left or to the right to see the poll. But if you're on a computer, it should be on your screen. If you're on a tablet, it should be on your screen. But what we wanna do is I want you to think about these four themes. Which do you believe is most important? Standing in spiritual authority, 
giving to support the work of ministry, understanding spiritual warfare, or being spiritually confident. Amen. Amen. We're going to give you a couple more minutes. I'm, I'm sorry, a couple more seconds. Give about 15 more seconds for those that are answering these questions. Amen. Because we have to think about what's important for the church today. And this is what Paul wanted to make sure that was being discussed as he came back with this second letter. So, bless you. Amen. So here we go. Let me show you what you answered. Okay. Half of you said standing in spiritual authority. And then it split. The rest of the answers were split between giving to support the work of ministry and then being spiritually confident. And I noticed that no one selected spiritual warfare. Amen. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about all four of these themes. And I'm going to tell you right now that all four of these are important as we move forth in our life in Christ. All of them are working together consistently. Okay, let's keep going. All right, let me stop the polling now. All right. So we are in the book of 2 Corinthians, starting with the first chapter. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you exactly the address of the verse, and then I will expound upon the verse, and we'll keep going. That, that's going to be the, the way we're going to do this. The first theme is spiritual authority. 2 Corinthians first chapter, starting with the 20th verse, says, for all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now he would establish us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who have sealed us and given us the earnest of the spirit in our hearts. So Paul wanted everyone to understand right now, just he was speaking to this church, and as God is speaking to us today, that the promises of God cannot be thwarted. The promises of God cannot be thwarted by the devil. You are established in the Lord and anointed by him. That means God has given you his endorsement. And not only that, you're sealed, which means that God has put a lid on it. Okay? Think about when you when you're putting something away, you seal, you seal a container, you seal a box, you seal a jar. Well, God, according to this word, said in verse 22, said, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the spirit in our hearts. In other words, God has given us a deposit of the Holy Ghost in our hearts, and we can rejoice in that. So this is how Paul started out with Second Corinthians saying, hey, wait a minute, y'all, understand this, that God and his purposes are forever. They cannot be changed. God is sovereign. And no devil, no false doctrine, none of that can change what God's got going for us that are in the kingdom. Now, chapter 2, verse 14. And we're, we're only going to be in Second Corinthians, y'all, so I'm, I'm, I'll just tell you the chapter and the verse. So chapter 2, verse 14, 2 Corinthians, it says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the Savior of his knowledge by us in every place. The Bible clearly tells us, greater light, that God causes us to triumph. Well, what does that mean? Triumph is not a word that we use all the time in our normal language. So let's break it down. What does triumph mean? It means by definition, it's a significant success or noteworthy achievement or instance or an occasion of victory. Now, what's significant about this, that this verse says, we're, let's thank God, right? Who always causes us to triumph in Christ. Let me tell you something. God, it says, always causes us to triumph. There is no failure in Christ, none. No failure in Christ. God 
always causes us to triumph. It might not look like we are getting the victory right now. It might not look like that we are advancing in the midst of all this wickedness and peril that the word is going through. It might not look like it, but God says in his word that he always causes us to triumph. Chapter three, verse three, starting with verse three. Second Corinthians chapter three, verse three. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think that anything is of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. Here it is, folks. Key point. Our sufficiency is of God. And I want you to repeat that to yourselves right now. Say, my sufficiency is of God. My sufficiency is of God and not ourselves. So church, take yourselves off the hook, <laughs> right? That doesn't mean that we don't have to work. Doesn't mean that we have, don't, don't have to pray, don't have to fast. Oh, we do all those things, but here it is. Our sufficiency is of God. God makes it go. I hear Deacon Stevenson saying, God makes it go. God makes us go. Hallelujah. Then it says, back to verse three, for as much as ye are manifestly declared, talking about you, are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ. So you are an epistle of Christ. You, every one of you, every one of you, everyone here on this Zoom right now, here at church this morning. You have been commissioned by the Lord. Now here's what he said. He said, this is not written in ink. Okay, so this is not a worldly, not a worldly commission. This is nothing that man can do for you. This is only by the hand of the Lord, because it says, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. In other words, God has written in our hearts, our communion with him. God has written in our hearts, our sufficiency in him. God has written in our hearts everything that pertains to us and our relationship with him. It's in our hearts. Same chapter, same chapter, chapter three. Let's go to verse 17. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face beholding as a, in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. Yes, God wrote it upon your heart. And then he gave you his spirit. And where God's spirit is, there's liberty. And then he says, yes, as you grow in the Lord, you're going to change from Glory to glory. You are no longer bound by the things of this world. Hear that. We are not bound by the things of this world. You're not even the same person you were when you first came to Christ. You have evolved over the years into his image. So you have gotten better, you've gotten stronger, you've gotten wiser over the years as you begin to get deeper and deeper in the word and deeper and deeper into the relationship with God. And God has used you to be his representative in the earth. You've evolved into his image. There's no doubt about it. There's no, if you are a Christian and you walk into a room and people know you, they're going to identify you as a Christian. Why? Because it's in your nature now. God is, 
has, has enveloped your spirit. God has given you all of these things. God has given you a place in the kingdom. There's no doubt about it. And the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? The gospel, the good news, the gospel is our guiding example that we live by. We live by the gospel. Everyone in this church can quote scripture. Everyone in this church can pray. Everyone in this church knows how to fast. Hallelujah. There's no doubt about it. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that's our example. And we live by that. We, we, we operate. We think like that. It is unnatural for us to think contrary if we're totally in with God. It's, it's, it's hard to, to break out of that. And you say, well, Elder, what do you mean? I'm saying once you are committed and sold out to Christ, you don't want to sin. You don't want to do stuff wrong. You don't want to you don't want to just be out of sync with God. You want to be completely lined up with what the word says that's in us. He wrote it on our heart. Then Paul comes back in chapter four, verse three. He says, but if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is an acknowledgement that Paul was making that the world is lost. And that same acknowledgement is today in 2020, November 29th. The gospel is hidden to them that are lost. They can't see it, church. Understand what I'm saying to you. You, you cannot, you cannot Get yourself all wrapped up and all discombobulated when people of the world are not responding because they can't see it. The word is very clear. If the gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. They've been blinded in their, according to the word, they've been blinded in their minds because they don't believe. This is why it's dangerous for anybody to be a non-believer. Because if you are a non-believer or if anybody is a non-believer, look at verse four, 2 Corinthians 4, chapter 4, verse, in whom the God of this world, Satan, have blinded the minds of them which believe not. The God of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not. Folks, you got to understand people that are not believers, they're blinded. They cannot see what we see spiritually. They can't see it. What we have to do is help people to first believe. How do you get someone else to believe? They believe based on what we say. They believe based on what they see us. They might not ever open the Bible, even though they could download it on their phone. They might not even look at it, but they will look at you. That's why earlier the Bible clearly told us that we are epistles People read us, people feel us, people hear us, people see us, and that's what they get. You are a walking testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because what if they never, ever open the word of God? Your lifestyle, your life is the example that could cause them to believe. And then once they become a believer, once they say, oh, I believe God, I acknowledge God. I want to live my life towards God. Then, then they can receive 
the word of God. Chapter four, verse seven, and here it is. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, uh-huh, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, right, but not in despair. Persecuted, yeah, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Now, this was written in A.D. 56, after death 56. And Paul was saying, hey, y'all, we got trouble, okay? But we don't got to be stressed out. Hey, we might not be able to figure this out. We might be perplexed, but we're not in despair. We got hope. We might get persecuted. Yeah, things are going to get crazy, but we're not forsaken. We might even be cast down. They might beat us down and do all that, but we're not destroyed, right? Because Jesus, Jesus, that the life, of Jesus might be made manifest in us, in our body. So church, greater light, greater light. Listen, this means that we may go through the same events as the world. We can go through the same exact experiences, but we don't have the same circumstances. What are you talking about, Elder? If, if it's raining outside, if it's raining, it don't matter if you're saved or unsaved, believer or unbeliever. If you go outside and it's raining, you're going to get wet. Do you agree with that? Okay. But here's the thing. The difference is that if you go outside in the elements and everybody gets wet, well, the impact of the wetness as far as how it affects you could be different than how it affects somebody else. Somebody else can go outside and catch a cold because they got rain on their head. You can go outside and get rain on your head and it don't bother you at all. So I want you to look at that spiritually. We might be going through as we are the pandemic. We might be going through all of these things, right? But we don't have to have the same circumstantial scenarios manifest in our lives if we understand the favor of God. Now, I'm not saying that we can't, we're not successful to things that are out there. No, we are, but I'm saying that our circumstances might be different because of God's will on our lives. If it's God's will that you never get sick, you won't get sick. It's God's will that you rise above circumstances, then you will rise above circumstances. We have the favor of God. Fifth chapter, verse seven. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Very popular scripture. We don't put our trust in what we see. If you're looking for a visible, tangible sign, you can be fooled. You can be fooled. And it may look like things are not going in your favor. And it may look like things are all happening at once. And it may look like that things are terrible. It may look like there's no end in sight. It may look like that the church is suffering. It may look like people are defeated, people are fallen, people are dying. It may look like all of those things, but what do your faith see? What do your faith see? Walk by faith and not by sight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And I want you guys to hear this. We have another poll coming. Here's another one. I want to ask a question. We got more people here now. Let's let's here's a question for you. And the question is, 
How easy or hard is it to walk by faith and not by sight? Go ahead and cast your vote. And by the way, these votes are anonymous, so no one's going to track you know, who voted what. But the point is, how easy or hard is it to walk by faith and not by sight? Is it always easy? Is it sometimes easy and sometimes hard? Or is it always hard? Cast your vote. How easy or hard is it to walk by faith and not by sight? And if you can't see the poll, type your answer in the chat. Is it easy or hard to walk by faith and not by sight? Would love if everybody would answer because we're talking about moving forward in the midst of these last days. How easy or hard is it to walk by faith and not by sight? Hallelujah. Yes. I see the answers coming in. Yes. Yes. See, sometimes God just gives us very practical things to think about. He's asking you this morning. How easy or hard is it for you to walk by faith and not by sight? Everybody who just answered the question on the poll, 100% said, sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's hard. Hallelujah. So there it is. Sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's hard. Thank you, Jesus. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about this life that we have in the Lord in the midst of a pandemic in 2020, when the Lord could come back through the skies at any time. And here it is, chapter five, verse 17. For those of you who came on late, we're, on, we're in second Corinthians. I'm doing a summary of the, of the book. Every scripture is coming right out of 2 Corinthians. I'll give you the chapter and the verse. Chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So you're saying that it's sometimes easy and it's sometimes hard to walk by faith and not by sight. And God comes right back and says, wait a minute, you're a new creature. Okay, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You're not the same person that you were before. You're brand new. If you begin to look at yourself as brand new, then the newness, the newness, the newness will appear evident to you. And as we move forward in this newness, and as you allow yourself to uh, let go of the old person, and I know, I know we got reminders that come and just, you know, we go through these things where sometimes we revert back to the old way of thinking. And then that's when things become hard again. But you're not the same person that you were before. If any man or woman be in Christ, he or she is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Verse 20, same chapters, chapter five. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Church, listen to this. It says, he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Paul is talking about spiritual authority here. You are an ambassador for Christ. We say, well, Elder, what's an ambassador? An ambassador is an authorized messenger or a representative. So in other words, you, church, are an ambassador for Christ, 
That means wherever you go, wherever you might find yourself, whoever you might be with, you as an ambassador for Christ are an authorized messenger for the Lord. You represent God. You represent Jesus Christ. And you might not be used to or very comfortable with that kind of spiritual authority, but God has given that to every one of us. Now, let me give you an example, though. You remember when God was telling Moses that he needed to lead the children of Israel? And, he, and Moses asked God, he said, well, God, well, well, really, what should I say to them? And God came right back and said, I am that I am. And let them know that I am sent me unto you. Moses was God's ambassador, just like today in your respective ministry assignments, you are God's ambassadors. You say, Elder, I got a ministry assignment? Yes, you do. Hmm. Hallelujah. You have a ministerial assignment somewhere in your life. You have spiritual authority to exercise and to walk that out in your life. You are God's ambassador, an ambassador for Christ. Now, because of that designation, church, and this is what Paul was telling these, these, these people back then. He said, wait a minute. Once you get into this thing, and once you understand your delegated spiritual authority from the Lord, because of that designation, you can't just be running around with just anybody. The anointing of God, and I know y'all know this, the anointing of God is very attractive to people. People are attracted to the anointing. It draws people to you. It draws people to you. People are attracted to your anointing. They don't even know why they're attracted to you. They're attracted to your anointing. And it could be anybody. But you got to be careful. You got to be careful. Don't you think the enemy would love to send one of his agents to get entangled up with you and get things all twisted up and get you all distracted and coming off your assignment. Got to be careful. So this is why in chapter six, Paul came right back, verse 14, and he says, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion have light with darkness? And what concord have Christ with Belial? Or what part have he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement have the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell with them and walk with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, and saith the Lord God Almighty. Y'all ain't heard that one in a while, right? Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Modern day translation. Disconnect. Disconnect. I'm not saying don't engage. I'm saying disconnect from those that are not thinking, worshiping the truth like you are. Now, what we're talking about here is when God says, don't be unequally yoked together, he says, don't have any, any formal binding type of entanglements with anyone that is not a believer. God's telling you in his word, telling us. Now, we can stay engaged to non-believers because we got to deliver the truth. Like we said, we got we to show them our lives and we got to be able to be an example. So we're not saying disengage. We're just saying, don't get yourself caught up. Amen. 
Now, if you find yourself in that situation, chapter 7, verse 10 comes into play. It says, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Here it is. It says, for godly sorrow worketh repentance. If we find ourselves in a scenario where we have to get it right, simply just repent. If you, deem, if you do need to repent for something, and we all do at one point in time or another, then allow our hearts to be yielded unto God so that we can get that thing right with him. We don't want to be separated from God. Eighth chapter, starting with verse nine. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you, and have begun before, not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so that there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. For if there first be a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. So now Paul's talking about giving. God is looking for progress. He's given us a roadmap, the Bible. He's given us a guide, the Holy Ghost, to move things along. God wants to settle this whole thing about people's hesitancy to support the ministry. You got to make up in your mind that you're willing to do what he wants you to do, willing to go where he wants you to go, willing to say what he wants you to say because you want to do his will. Thank you, Prophet Elijah, for the lyrics to that song. Amen. Here it is, folks. God accepts you according to that what you have. He's not counting chips that you don't have. If you don't got them, God's not counting that. That's not applicable to you. What, what is applicable to you is what you do have. And that's how God equalizes it for everyone. And still on this subject of giving, Ninth chapter, six verse says, but I say this, he which sow it sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which sow it bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Every man as he purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Give like you want God to give to you. It's simple. There's no gimmicks, no tricks. It's a simple formula. You sow, then you reap. The spiritual law cannot be broken. Whatever you decide to do, then that's what you're going to get. You reap what you sow. That's the word of the Lord. And God can make all grace, all favor abound towards you. We've seen many examples of that within our ministry. And you can have the best circumstances for your situation. And that's why he says, always having all sufficiency in all things. It's an incredible promise so that you may abound to every good work. So in other words, God will provide what is needed for the work that you got to get done. Whether that's work within the ministry based on your ministerial assignments, whether that's work in your profession, that's work with your family, work out in the marketplace, whatever it is, God's given us sufficiency in all things. And then he talks about spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. We're just about done. But here we go. We're going to look at the spiritual warfare. Here's another question for you. Oh, sorry. I didn't know that was still on the screen. Sorry about that. Another question. Spiritual warfare. Do you recognize when you are engaged in spiritual warfare? How many of you recognize when you are engaged in spiritual warfare? Yes, no, or sometimes. Do you recognize when you're engaged in spiritual warfare? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we're trying to understand. Do you know when the devil is messing with you? Do you know when the devil 
is behind certain circumstances and things that are happening in your life? Do you recognize when you are involved in spiritual warfare? Okay. Let's look at the results. Here it is. Most of you said yes. Some of you said sometimes. Nobody said no, which is great, but here it is. We're in spiritual warfare. The 10th chapter of 2 Corinthians says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Church, the war is raging. Never forget it. We will be engaged with, in spiritual warfare until the Lord comes back. But you have to fight spiritually. You cannot fight in your flesh. The battle is in the mind. The battle could be in your heart. The battle could be in your spirit. Understand this and understand what we're working with. And then you'll have what you need to move forward. The 11th chapter, 2 Corinthians 14th verse says, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed as an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So what is he saying? Paul was letting everybody know that the devil can emulate anybody. Yes. The devil can preach like Bishop Jakes. The devil can show love like Pastor Hackett. He can disguise himself however he wants to get whatever he wants to get into. Recognize the game. That's what the Lord is saying right here. He said, wait a minute, don't be fooled. Understand this. Then 12th chapter, and we're, I'm going to be closing here. 12th, 12th chapter, 9th verse, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That was Paul saying, wait a minute, I might go through and I might be in the battle. I might be in the fight and I might feel weak and I might get down, but in my weakness, his strength is made perfect. God's grace is what we need to survive. That even in distresses, even in weaknesses, we can rest in the fact that the power of Christ can rest upon us. Remember this always. Then finally, here's my last scriptures, chapter 13, verses 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints salute you and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. The second epistle to the Corinthians was written from Philippi, a city of Macedonia by Titus and Lucas. So there you have it. Paul's final salutation to be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and God's peace shall be with you. This is the letter with, that he wrote to the church at Corinth to respond to the things that were going on in the day. So here are things to walk in spiritual authority, exercise your ability to give spiritually, give to the ministry and support the work of the ministry, come out victorious in spiritual warfare and live in spiritual confidence. That's what God put in our Bibles through the Apostle Paul from the book of 2 Corinthians. God bless you. I pray that something that was said in this letter spoke to your heart about this life that we live in the Lord and that we can make it and that God's got our back. We just got to stay in the fight and do what we can 
to honor him every day of our lives and move forward as believers. Amen. God bless you all. Amen. Praise the Lord. God provided an awesome word to us this morning. Thank you, Elder, for allowing God to use you. That was powerful. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I just want to do a, a little bit of a recap of what Elder shared with us this morning coming out of, uh, he was in the first and second books of Corinthians, and he taught this morning out of the second book. Just to give you a little background of what he said, he um, said that this was in the third year of Paul's ministry in Ephesus. He mentioned that this was around the time of 56 AD. He also said, you know, AD basically 56 years after the death and resurrection of Christ, Paul wrote this letter. He also said that Paul wrote a total of four letters, if I got it down right, and one of them was lost. But Paul um, was answering lots of questions from Corinth. And uh, there was a lot of, of things that were going on at that time, people that were trying to discredit Paul because of who he was or used to be, because as Elder mentioned, he was formerly Saul, a persecutor of the Christians, but God had changed him into Paul. So there was a lot of distrust. There was a lot of different stories that were going about, but see, Paul did not let any of those things stop him from his ministry. And he was, in these letters, he was answering multiple questions about the Christian walk. And as God gave me, I wrote down the guidelines for the Christians, not only for that day, but also for today. He said that our ministry has to be guarded from attack because there are multiple ways that the enemy will try and attack our faith, discredit us, even as he did Paul, cause us to, to, to doubt what God has started in us. But he also said we must be confident that we are commissioned by Christ, that, that, that Jesus himself has called us to be a part of his ministry. He said that there are four themes in this book, spiritual authority, giving, warfare, confidence. And I'm just going to just touch on a few of these because he had many things to say. And I hope that as he was going forth, you were taking notes so that you will be able to go back over these scriptures and all that he was able to share with us because there is a multitude of information that is there that will help our walk. But the first one is he talked on spiritual authority. It is not of your own accord, but it is of the authority of the Lord Jesus that you can stand before anybody and lift up the gospel, the word of truth. He, he also talked about how even though it might look like we are losing the battle, we are always triumphant in Christ Jesus. For there is no failure in Jesus. Jesus has never lost a battle, nor will he ever lose a battle. He said our self-sufficiency is of God. 
the great I am that I am. He also mentioned that. He says, he, Moses asked him, what or whom should I tell the people has sent me? And God told him, tell them, I am that I am. In other words, he was saying the all sufficient one, the one who has no beginning or no ending because he is self-sufficient. And in him, we are sufficient. He said that you and me, we are an apostle of Christ. He said that we have liberty in the Lord Jesus. We live by the gospel. This is what we stand upon. This is what we live out day in and day out. He also mentioned that if our gospel be hidden, it is hidden to those that are lost, the ones that are trying to find their way. You know, it comes to mind, you know, have you ever been lost trying to find a certain address and you're going round and round in a circle and trying to figure it out? Well, there are those that are in this world. They're trying to find their way and they're lost. And it's up to us who know the truth to point them in the right direction. He said that the world cannot see or hear the truth. You ever wonder why when you're, when you're having a conversation with somebody and you're talking to them about the gift of salvation and all that Jesus has, has done for you, that they have a look of perplexion upon their face. They can't quite understand what you're saying. They really don't hear the words that are coming out of your mouth because, see, it takes the Spirit of God to open them up to see and hear. He says, our mission is to help people to believe. That's what Paul was doing. And, and he also said, well, well, how do we do that? We do it by what we say and how we live. We have to be that living testimony to them. Sometimes you can do more for a person's life, leading them to Christ by how you live than what comes out of your mouth. Because they're watching you. They're listening to you. And they're trying to see and find their way to Christ Jesus. He said, even though we might have troubles on every side, we can rest with an assurance that Jesus has our backs. He said, we walk by faith and not by sight. See, it's easy to believe in something that you see, but it's even more difficult to believe in what you do not see. But see, we can be like the man whose son was tormented by the demons. And he said, Lord, help mine unbelief. We can ask for more and God will give it to us because we ask. He said that we are a new creature in Christ Jesus. We are an ambassador for Christ. We have a position. We have a foundation, the solid rock that we can stand upon. And when we talk to someone about Jesus, it's as if Jesus himself were talking to them because we are his emissary. We are his representative. We are the authority of Christ. He has authorized us to be the messenger of God. He also talked about how we are the temple of the living God. We cannot be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. We need to separate ourselves from those that do not believe to those that do believe. How do we protect our relationship, our fellowship with Christ Jesus is because we 
associate with those that believe in what we believe in. He says, if we run afoul and, and, and make errors or missteps, we can repent and come back into the fold. That is a gift through Christ Jesus. He talked about giving, which is what God supports his ministry by. Giving to the church, supporting our pastor and the ministry. He also said that we need to be a cheerful giver without reservation, without second thoughts, but do it with a willing heart and be supportive of our ministry. He talked about spiritual warfare. Do we not know that the enemy is constantly attacking us, whether it be through our minds, our bodies, our, our spiritual relationship, but we have to recognize him for what he is and that we can overcome him through Christ Jesus because he overcame him. He also said that the war is raging. If only we could see into the spirit realm all that is going forth, there is a vicious raging war that is happening even right now because they're fighting over your soul. Do you understand that there's a war that's going on? He said that the devil can emulate anybody out there. He will come as a spirit of light, even though he is full of darkness. Understand your opponent in the warfare. He said that even though I might be weak, Christ Jesus is strong in me. And then he said, finally, and I'll read this scripture. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind. Live in peace and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Paul was instructing the people how to live this Christian life, how to walk it out, how to have relationship with Jesus. He was giving us guidelines, a roadmap of how to get there and get it done. Elder, I thank God for using you this morning a powerful word that you shared with us, so many points that you touched upon. And I pray that everybody listening got a portion of what God was talking about this morning. But at this time, I'm going to open the floor for anybody that has a thought or a word that they would like to share about what was said this morning. Those that are on their telephones, if you will uh, star six and star nine and prepare yourselves. And those that are uh, on the Zoom, if you will just raise your hand, we'll do those that are on the Zoom first, and then we'll come back to those that are on their phones. But anybody have a thought or a comment this morning that they would like to share? Praise the Lord, um, Elder. Praise the Lord, Elder Stubberfield. That was a powerful, powerful word this morning. I thank God for, for the Lord using you to deliver the word. So many things as you go down, went down the line related and, and re everything that you said was, an, was to uplift and encourage and help us to grow higher and stronger in the Lord. Um, one of the points that I wrote down is be careful who you expose yourself to amen as spiritual beings we have to be careful who we expose ourselves to because as you said the enemy would like to destroy us latch on to us and and drain us of our our anointing of the the god that dwells in us if we allow ourselves to be taken in we have to allow ourselves to go to allow the enemy to 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 
come in and, and like a flood and, and we can be deceived. We can be deceived if we are not focused on Jesus. If we don't allow him to take preeminence in our lives, the enemy is as a roaring lion can destroy, as a roaring lion, he can present himself as an angel of light. And if we are not rooted and grounded in God, we can be weak. The Bible says the very elect, if it were possible, could be deceived. So we have to make sure that we are among the elect. Amen. Called and chosen is good, but make sure to strive, strive to seek God, strive to walk upright before him so we can be among the elect this morning. It's good for, we must congregate, but we cannot condescend to what the world has to offer. We cannot let our guards down. We have to stand strong and firm in that that we which we believe. God bless you. Thanks for the word this morning. I am sure that we all were blessed. Thank you, Elder Harris. Amen. Powerful word, Elder Stubblefield. And thank you, Pastor, because we have to make an assurity of our walk with Christ Jesus. Don't take it for granted. Make an assurity each and every day. Make sure that you're on the right path. And as Elder said, if you're not, we can always repent, but we want to get it right. We don't want to find ourselves left out. Anybody else this morning have a thought or something that they would like to share about the word this morning? Thank you, Lord. I, I know somebody got something besides me and Pastor. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody on their phone? All right, Sister Trish. Go ahead, Sister Trish. Praise the Lord. Um, thank you, Elder Stubble, for, for, Phil, for that beautiful, awesome message. That was awesome. Uh, I love how you did the, um, the questionnaire thing. I don't know where we can participate. I, I like stuff like that. That was awesome. Thank you for that word. I just feel like I grew just a little bit more today. <laughs> I just want to say thank you for that awesome word. I enjoy this. I always enjoy this uh, Sunday school. All Everybody is awesome. But I really enjoyed that this morning. Thank you so much for letting God use you as always. Thank you so much. Man, I agree, Sister Trish. It was a powerful word this morning. I don't want to miss anybody. If anybody has something that they would want to share. Um, so I do. <clears throat> Go ahead. Sister Joma, you had your hand up. Just unmute yourself. Sister Joma, are you there? <laughs> All right. Hear me now? Or yep, we can hear you. Praise the Lord. I pressed on mute, but it just didn't work out. Um, oh. But I wanted to encourage the man of God. I thank God for you and thank you for allowing the Lord to use you. It's always a blessing to hear you minister as well as everyone else. But I just want to encourage you and and um, you are a blessing to the people of God, myself included. So yeah, I thank God for you. Amen. Amen. It was a powerful <laughs> word. Sister Madeline, are you on the line? You had your hand up. Yes, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Elder Stubblefield, I really enjoyed the word this morning. Um, and uh, I had been reading some of that word. And in my phone, I got it a lot of that, all, had a lot of those scriptures already highlighted. And, and, you know, it just helped me to continue to press forward and trying to understand more about warfare, the spiritual warfare, and how to just continue to stand through 
the warfare that we're going through because I, I truly believe that right now this is a spiritual warfare, a real spiritual warfare that we're going through with this pandemic and people is not really understanding what's going on, but I'm just focusing on trying to keep stay in my word and keep my ears and my eyes on Jesus. And thank you very much for the word. And I will <laughs> be going back and uh, getting the uh, the uh, video, listen to it, listen to it for more. Thank you again. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Madeline. Sister Pamela, go ahead. Praise the Lord. I just want to. Thank God, hallelujah. Uh, thank the Lord for allowing uh, Brother Stubblefield, Elder Stubblefield, to come forth with the positive words and encouragement to his people. What I feel um, I got most from this message today is continue to build your spiritual confidence. That just stuck with my heart so powerfully that if on a regular basis you will continue to stay in your word and ask God to reveal those things that are unclear to you and continue to build on your spiritual confidence. That is going to help us through the spiritual warfares, through building our authority and feeling comfortable with standing on his word, trusting and believing in God. And it just, man, it's just so powerful. So I wanna thank you, Brother Stubblefield, for again, just encouraging the body of Christ. And fear not, people, we have to be that beacon of light that those lost ones are looking for. Even though we are not to indulge, if you will, with those that are unlike spirited. We have to be that light, even if it's from afar. Because we are in the spiritual warfare, God is looking for us to bring them into his marvelous light. So again, I thank you. And may God continue to strengthen and bless you and your family. In Jesus' name, thank you. Amen. Thank you, Sister Pam. We definitely have to be that example to all those that are around us. Because, see, if our if our light is growing dim or if it's flickering, you know, it, it, it's not going to be able to show somebody the the pathway. That's why we need to be vigilant in our walk that our light always remains bright that the lost will be able to find their way. Anybody else this morning? I don't want to miss anybody if you have something you want to say. Um, I want to say something, Elder Harris. All right. Um, Elder Stubblefield, thank you so much for, you, um, for allowing the Lord to use you this morning. Your word, I got so much out of it. Um, a couple, a few things that stuck out to me when you were talking about the people that don't believe how... Um, their eyes are just got a veil over them. They cannot see. Um, they just don't have the heart open to know the truth. And it brought me back for when before I, I knew the Lord. Um, I always knew that God was real, but I just remember that my life was so empty. You know, I always felt like there was so much more that I'm looking for. And I remember the people that God brought across my path uh, to give me an encouraging word or me to, to see the light in them. And it brought me back that how it's important for us to be as believers to continue to let our light shine because there may be some that eyes are, are, are blinded or they may not believe, but because of our walk and who we stand and who we are, they, you never know how that may impact their life. So I just thank God for you. Thank you so much. Um, and it, it was just a really good word. And like Sister Madeline said, 
want to go back and listen to it again um, on the website. So God bless you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Felicia. It was a powerful word. Well, at this time, we're going to move on with our service. Uh, I guess uh, Deacon Wolf would like to say something. Uh, Deacon, go ahead. Yes, look, can you hear me? We can hear you. God bless you. God bless y'all. Uh, I want to first of all just say thanks be to God for, for being here this morning and being able to be on the line with you all. And thank God for Elder Stufferfield that, uh, man, you you brought a powerful word this morning. And so like, like uh, Elder Harris said, you had so many points. I just want to touch on just two, just, just two things. When you, you ask the question, is it easy to walk by sight or, or by faith? Uh, if, if Brian Bonifer was here this morning, we can see he was a man that was born blind and couldn't walk by sight. But he cried out one day, son of David, have mercy on me. And God, Jesus asked him, what would you have me to do? And he said, I want to receive my sight. So his faith and believing that God, could, Jesus could do it. And another one, uh, the woman that had the issue of blood for 12 years, by her sight, she went to doctors after doctors, and they could do her no good. But one day, it said she came to herself, and she said, if I believe, if I can just touch the hem of Jesus' garment, I can be made whole. By her faith, she pressed her way through the crowd and touched Jesus. Man, uh, I, I thank God for you. My mother had to thank God for the word that you saying. Thank God for what you were doing. And, and, and I just thank God for the teaching and the fellowship and the love that greater life that y'all have uh, for one another. That's the only thing that's going to keep us when we uh, illustrate the love for one another and just continue to be blessed and, and just continue to, to stay strong in the faith and, and walk by faith and not by sight, knowing that God will bless us if we continue to do and live the way he wants us to live. God bless y'all. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Deacon Wolf, for, for your comments and, and for joining us this morning. And again, Amen. we just want to just give God the glory for, for using Elder Stubblefield this morning. Now we're going to move on with our service uh, this morning. Uh, we want to open up for the opportunity to give into the Sunday School Ministry. Uh, and you can do that by going to the uh, greaterlight.org website. And there's a couple uh, ways there that you can uh, participate in the giving through the church track or through the PayPal. But just know this, that your, your gifts are deeply appreciated. And it is what helps us and allows us to do what we do in the Sunday School Department. But at this time, we're going to have a word of prayer. If you will bow your heads with me in an act of reverence as we close out for this morning. Father God, we just come to you first and foremost, thanking you for all that you have said and illustrated to us this morning out of your word. Thank you, Lord, for using your servant, Elder Stubblefield, this morning. We ask for two blessings. One, we ask, Lord, that you will continue to bless and Use Elder Stubblefield in a great and a mighty way. Continue to open up his understanding to your word, that it would be an understanding unto the salvation of many, that his light would ever so shine to lead the lost into the kingdom, I pray. I pray over the word that has been given this morning, the bread of life that has been broken amongst us, that we would eat and sup, and that this word would would manifest much fruit in our lives, Lord. Help us all to focus on this word throughout the upcoming week. Help us to go back and read the scriptures and, 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 and refresh ourselves on what was said today, Lord. I ask, Lord, continue to bless the Greater Light Sunday School. Continue to bless all those who participated in it this morning, Lord. Now I ask, take us from this part of the service looking with great expectations, all that you have in store for the remainder of the service and all those that will be participating in it. 
that your will would be accomplished. And we ask, Lord, keep each and every one of us until the next opportunity comes that the Greater Light Sunday School Department can come together again. And we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, we're going to transition now into our morning service coming up. And since we ended a little bit late, we'll come back together about 1040 and start our service. So you can remain on the line or join us back at 1040 promptly and we'll restart service. Thank you for participating this morning. Amen.